Welcome to the Molecular Moments Podcast. In today's episode, we sat down with our guest, Mr. Mike Mortimer, co-founder and partner at London-based GHO Capital. Mike has had a distinguished career in healthcare, including senior leadership roles at Quintiles, board positions with numerous healthcare companies, including Bioagilytics, and for the last six years with GHO Capital. At Quintiles, he was part of a team that grew the company to be the dominant late stage CRO in the industry. And now at GHO Capital, his team directs funding to build the future of healthcare with a focus on European investments. Mike and I had a great discussion about his career, which followed a very interesting trajectory as we see with so many of my guests. And he gave me the opportunity to see a glimpse into the financial side of the pharmaceutical industry that many scientists don't ever delve into. Also on the mind of many around the world, we got an opportunity to get some of Mike's thoughts on Brexit. And of course, we took a little time to learn more about Mike's favorite ways to spend his leisure time. And without further ado, here's the fourth episode of Molecular Moments. Hi, Mike. Uh, Thanks for joining me on Molecular Moments. This is my fourth episode really excited to have a guest who's a non-scientist this time. So, uh, so far I've uh, focused on uh, speaking with scientists, but I'm really excited to to have somebody who's come at this uh, healthcare industry from a little bit different direction. Maybe you could just give me a little bit of an overview of your career and how you ended up in the healthcare space and, you know, in this role in GHO with, uh, with financing and things like that. Sure. Thanks, Chad. It's great to be here and be with uh, all of you today. Uh, I, I had a long and windy road into healthcare. Uh, I actually started in telecommunications early uh, in my uh, days right out of university. I then went into financial services and then ended up at a company called Quintiles uh, in 2003 and um, really uh, had uh, a great experience at that company. I worked with roughly 25, 30,000 professionals that were solely focused on creating better outcomes for patients. Uh, patient focused. It sounds a bit corny, but they were trying to make the world a better place. And from that experience, that that roughly 11 years there, I decided to stay in healthcare and take that experience and create a company with two partners that invests in healthcare companies that are doing healthcare better, faster, and uh, more affordable. With quintiles, I'm curious because Dennis Gillings, quite frankly, is kind of the the known guy, right? I mean, the founder and, and really the driver, a lot of that. But you had a big part of that growth as well. I'm curious a little bit more specifically about what your role was with quintiles. It was a great team. And it was a small group of us that uh, were privileged enough to run the company over that 10, 11 years while we were private. And uh, my role specifically was I ran all the back office administrative functions based out of North Carolina. And then in 2009, I moved to the UK to run Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Latin America. When you started uh, GHO, one of the items that I noticed on the website is you have a European focus and you're London based. So what's the motivation to put forward that European focus for your uh, investments? So it's a void in the market. In the U.S., uh, North America, you you have a number of private equity firms that are investing in healthcare, and they're excellent at what they do. In Europe, you really don't have anybody that was really focused on investing in small, medium-sized healthcare companies that were primarily focused on Europe. So I got together with my two partners. We created GHO, and what we do is slightly different than what you see in investment firms in the States. We look for opportunities in Europe that are doing healthcare better and try to bring those businesses to North America and North American businesses that we bring into Europe. And Bioagilics is a great example of a business based in the U.S., best in class, and we're helping the management team bring that best in class offering to Europe. Since you brought up bioagilytics, um, something I've wondered, and a lot of our conversation is going to be me as a scientist asking you as a as as somebody in that other side of the business some probably naive questions. But how does a deal like that sort of come together? Right, Cobipa is interested in bioagilytics, and they uh, bring in GHO, I, you know, something like that. Can you explain that to my mostly scientific <laughs> audience a little bit? Well, you know, th- these kinds of projects are never kind of linear. Um, they tend to uh, take long and windy roads. We saw, as a firm, saw Bioagilytics many years ago when we were 
invested in another business uh, based in Canada. And we always wanted to be a part of the BioAgilic story uh, for a variety of different reasons that didn't work out. But we got to know Jim Dayton, the CEO of BioAgilic quite well over several years. And when the opportunity came to invest in bioagilytics, we were privileged enough to be able to work with the management team and Copipa to back the management team in their next chapter of growth. Great experience. I think Jim and the management team pulled us into the deal and we brought a little bit more deeper domain expertise in healthcare than the Copipa team had to date. But you know, again, they're a really strong team and they know healthcare exceptionally well. We just gave that a little bit more incremental edge to the business. And I think our European footprint will help and has helped expand the business into, into Europe. Well, I'm one of the executives of Bioagilytics. Is, you know, I, uh, I'm not a full-time podcaster. I, uh, I can say that we're, we're fortunate for our ownership team. We really appreciate that. I've been through in my uh, CRO career with a number of companies, you know, being bought and sold by private equity in and out. Uh, some some of the big guys, KKR was an owner of my previous company and, and you know, going public and private and in a couple of different ways. Uh, whenever I talk with folks about that, they think of companies as they think of Pretty Woman, right? The, uh, the 80s, buy them, break them up, the Bear Stearns stories, things like that. How is what you do in the private equity world and the capital investment world today different from those stories of the 80s that we think of? Well, you don't look old enough to have actually worked in the 80s, but I think what's different, at least in our firm, uh, I can honestly say I worked in a private company for 11 years and we were quite large. And I saw, I think in that 11 years, the best of private equity and the worst of private equity. And the best of private equity is when it creates jobs, it creates opportunities for employees, it creates a unique service offering for your customers, and it actually does have impact on society. I think what's changed is there is a lot of focus on ESG, that focus on contributing or giving something back to your community, I think is top of mind for many, not all, but many private equity firms. And there's no better place to do social good than in healthcare. And I think you can see, and Biogenics and other firms are great examples of where investors can make a profit, but also provide a benefit to society. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I certainly every day I have calls uh, with multiple different pharmaceutical companies. And a bit ago, I was talking with a device manufacturer about home collections uh, related to COVID and so many cool things. Uh, there's just not enough time to do them all. So it's, yeah, it's exciting to be a part of a company that uh, that supports that. Getting back a little bit more generally speaking, when, when you guys are faced with an investment or an opportunity, tell me some of the things you look for in, in healthcare companies. I know you touched on this, but maybe you can just dive a little deeper into that. Sure. The first thing we look for is the strength and, and depth of the management team. So we won't invest in a business regardless of how good the financials are in a dysfunctional management team or a management team that has to you have to change. We look for strong management teams. With good, strong management teams, you can take pretty much any business and do great things. So starts with the management team, starts with the sector or the subsector in healthcare that that management team plays in. A bit about the, you know, the, the company and the geography that they work in. And can we internationalize that business? Can we grow it from, in some cases, Southern Europe to Northern Europe or from Europe to the US or the US to Europe. How has all of this business changed in 2020 with COVID? It, it wouldn't be a 2020 podcast without a mention of COVID somewhere, right? And, and I'd really like to understand how COVID has changed and evolved your thinking over, over time and, and, and how that affects your 2021 planning. Yeah, it's really strange. Uh, and 2020 has been a strange year on a lot of different levels. But as we look at 2020, uh, it was an unusual year because in the early days of COVID, in the March, April timeframe, the kind of work that we do and the investments that we were making virtually shut down. Post April, May, the growth in the number of opportunities, healthcare opportunities that came into the market was exponential. So many of our advisors are doing more than 
double the work that they did in 2019. So you have a lot of companies coming into the market. And what's changed for us is the ability to sit down with management teams and talk about how we can work with them to create value in their business. We're a rapport and relationship firm. And those relationships are really important for us to establish and build. And that's been probably the toughest thing we've had to face this year, the inability to meet not only with new relationships, but also with our existing management teams. You're in the U.S. Uh, today, but I, you know, you're London based. So you've gone back and forth a bit. How has that worked in COVID? I, I mean, bu- business aside, how, what are the realities of traveling to and from the U.K. now? Well, I've, I've done it now twice uh, this year, and I, I, it's surreal uh, to be on a plane uh, with only 20 people on, a, on the entire plane is pretty incredible, and the airports are empty. I think what stands out the most is really kind of the different attitudes towards health and safety. I live in central London. It's like any other big city. But being in uh, in Raleigh or being in New York, you know, the attitudes are just, they tend to be in the U.S., at least the places I've been, much more focused on wearing masks, washing your hands, social distancing. I recognize that's not the case everywhere in the U.S., just the places I've been. In the U.K., you walk down the street and nobody wears a mask. You go into the grocery store, nobody's wearing a mask. And that was as of maybe a month ago. So the mental attitudes are just different, as you'd expect in various cultures. But it's been interesting to watch and interesting to see how various geographies have kind of coped with COVID. I had an opportunity to go to Denmark uh, recently. And there you kind of ask the question, pandemic? What pandemic? You'd never know that anything was different. Restaurants were full. There was no social distancing. There was no mask. There was no place to wash your hands or sanitize your hands. But at that time, it was safe there. So it's been a a very unique experience. Yeah, uh, we've certainly seen that looking at the the global labs across bioagilytics. The the differences in in Durham and Boston are significant, but uh, especially when we talk with our colleagues in Hamburg and and how they're dealing with it and how the city and the government, it makes for for interesting uh, conversations, to say the least. Like you say, it's a a bit of a fascinating social experiment, and there's uh, there's probably going to be many many PhDs and so many different subjects written on <laughs> written related to the experiences of 2020, whether it's social or social or epidemiological or, or uh, virus, vaccine, everything. So. Uh, I'm curious about one thing from your career, and because I live in Overland Park, Kansas, uh, Sprint. So I saw Sprint was on your, you know, at least on your LinkedIn profile. It's kind of looks like where you uh, got a, an early start in your career. What what did you do with Sprint? And did you come down to Overland Park much? I don't think you lived here, did you? No, I didn't. I was uh, actually in the management development program there. So I had uh, rotational assignments throughout the Sprint organization. Uh, I worked on the telecommunication satellites and tracking those. And I uh, worked uh, selling long distance services and uh, dial up modems, everything soup to nuts. It was a great experience. I got down to Overland Park uh, quite often and great city. And it's kind of place you move and you never move out of, you know, it's very family friendly and It was a great experience because I think what's important, particularly for non-scientific people, to get a depth and breadth of experience that you bring to a situation. So I think the work I do today, if I hadn't had that sprint experience, I don't think I'd be as good as I could have been. And I'd say the learnings from the telecommunication industry and from the financial services industry, we applied to the Quintiles experience and the success that we enjoyed there. You mentioned moving to quintiles. What drew you into that healthcare field? Was there a, you know, was it just the right job at the right time or was there, was there something else kind of drawing you that direction? Yeah, I, I came from a, a company, uh, Charles Schwab, that uh, was founder led and driven. And I worked directly with um, the founder there and uh, an amazing uh, individual that had built this company from scratch. And that experience had run its course. I had a number of international assignments, and then I was asked to come back to the U.S. and work on U.S. domestic programs, and that wasn't what I wanted to do. And I got a call from someone. They wanted me to meet this guy, Dennis Gillings, and talk about this company that did 
drug development outsource services, a company I never heard of in my entire life. I never even knew the industry existed. But I, I think it was two things that drove me to Quintiles, three actually. I think one was Dennis and his personality and his vision. Internet brokerage is interesting, but it really is, you know, kind of, you can do it a lot of different places. And I wanted to do something different and meaningful. Uh, and I wanted to start making a difference. I had been fortunate to have a number of different experiences that now I could pick what I really, really wanted to do. And third, I think the opportunity at that time, you could see that outsource services and the pharma industry or biopharma industry were just starting to, to really kind of take shape. And I thought it was just a, an amazing opportunity to participate in something uh, fun and interesting, new and different. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting that you say that it was uh, kind of just that fortuitous opportunity and things line up. Because I think about when I got into the pharmaceutical healthcare industry, it wasn't really, it was more about an interesting company where I could run mass spectrometers and play with these really expensive toys that I thought was cool. And then as I got into it and started realizing what I was doing and what the impact was, and I worked on uh, one drug in particular, I guess I probably shouldn't name, but I had the opportunity in my career in my first CRO that I started in discovery with those projects and sort of developed the assays and was running samples. And then as I moved into project management and then management, that drug moved along and it got approved shortly before I left that company. So it was sort of, even though I wasn't with the pharmaceutical development group, it was so amazing to just see that progression. And obviously it's always stuck with me, but uh, those, those stories, and then you think about the patient's uh, the patients it makes an impact on. And, and uh, the more drugs you see go through the system, the more you think about, wow, we supported those drugs. And having been at Quintiles, you, you guys probably touched half, three quarters or more of the drugs that were approved in the last uh, 15, 20 years. So uh, that's really, uh, really amazing. Yeah, actually a bit more. <laughs> Might be that you touched every one of them at some point. Yeah. You know, I think that's really what it's all about. And I have a tremendous amount of respect for the people that have the technical ability to take and work these really minute problems and create life-changing drugs and life-changing therapies. And as we emerge into cell and gene therapies and, you know, all the vaccine mRNA work that's going on now, it's just, this is an amazing time to be in healthcare, an amazing time. And I hope the rest of society outside of the space, outside of drug development, uh, realizes the amount of collaboration. And we work every day with competitors in what I, you know, what I say are the non-competitive spaces, right? How can we be better in ways that just help society, you know, and ultimately help our business. But that's the way that we're able to do some of these really rapid advances, right? The mRNA vaccines, as we talked about. One of the participants in this call I had earlier today with the home collection is a competitor of ours, but they, they're offering something different to the relationship than we are. And we're, it's just going to make it better for everybody. So on your side of it, do you see that same sort of collaboration again on that, you know, on the financial side of it? Yeah, you do see a lot of partnering. Uh, and I think that different firms have different behaviors and different cultures, but you do see partnering. And I think our relationship with Copeep is a good example of that. We don't view ourselves as competitors per se, but there are situations where we'll look at an opportunity. They'll look at that same opportunity and there's other situations where we'll look at opportunities together. One of the big topics that I wanted to talk to you about is Brexit. You're London-based, you know, you're focused on Europe, and then Brexit comes along. Now, I found a significant irony in inviting an American to join him for a discussion on Brexit, and it seemed like about the most American way to go about it. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I think you can have some great insights for us. So maybe just lay out what you're seeing and how you've been feeling, how that's evolved over the last three years, I think it's been since Brexit was uh, voted in. Yeah, in, in short, it's a mess. And it's been a mess for many years because there's been a lack of strategic direction and or intent. I think that governments are confused, the people are confused, companies are confused, but I think there are a couple of things that are specifically related to healthcare that we are starting to see more clarity. So uh, supply chain is a concern that many people had, and I think COVID has been a good test of supply chain. So many businesses in the UK had to adapt their supply chain to kind of the new COVID environment. And many people have come away thinking that this could be a model 
you know, in a new post-Brexit implementation era. So supply chain disruption, I think, has been sorted. And the companies that we've invested in and the companies that we work in seem to have come up with solutions to ensure that there's constant steady supply chain so that they can actually do API manufacturing, CDMOs, CMOs, that sort of thing. I think the regulatory climate is also something that comes up quite often. And as you think about the MHRA and their scrutiny over the UK and then the EU regulators, the good news is it looks like the MHRA is going to default to EU dossiers. So that rub kind of comes out of the system naturally, which is, I think, for many of you on this call in the biopharma industry, a good outcome. As you think about, you know, kind of wrinkles in the system, you have this odd situation with Northern Ireland. So Northern Ireland, I just did my, uh, I'm, I'm getting UK citizenship. So I've just gone through my knowledge test of the UK. So I actually know this one. Um, Northern Ireland is a standalone entity and outside Brexit. So as it relates to Uh, kind of the EU regulatory environment, Northern Ireland will be in a EU regulatory environment and the UK will be under MHRA. So I I think that there might be some confusion around that, that wrinkle, but we're confident that that'll get all sorted and actually that may actually be a benefit. And some of the concerns around supply chain and distribution and manufacturing get sorted as a result of that arbitrage between the two geographies. Will that have an impact? I want You talked about supply chain. I wonder if we'll see if that'll cause supply chain to flow through Northern Ireland. There has been discussion around floating supply chain through Northern Ireland, but actually what's happened is that there are other paths uh, across the channel. So instead of going to Calais, they're going farther north into some of the northern cities to avoid some of the backlog in these ports because the goods need to be inspected and they sit in these car parks for weeks until the border force can inspect these cargoes. Whereas if they go to other less popular ports, they tend to get processed a bit more quickly. It seems like most of what I've read, the feeling is that this is not good for UK pharma. Maybe some of the clues you've given us say it's not going to be as bad as uh, first thought. What have you seen on biotech funding specifically then between Europe and the UK? Have there been changes or impacts there that you're following? I think one of the big impacts that Brexit will have on the UK is people. So the ability to take talent from continental Europe and bring them into the UK easily will be much more difficult going forward. The demand for talent in the UK is huge. So I think talent is probably the biggest issue that the UK will face as it relates to Brexit in healthcare. Yeah, well, I don't think that's a unique challenge. I know we've been hiring rapidly at Bioagilytics, and there's a wealth of scientific talent in Asia in the challenge of getting visas, right, readily, which would only cause their business to grow is becoming an, an increasing challenge. So, uh, so yeah, that challenge probably isn't unique to the UK, but of course, with Europe so close and a destination, right, I think a lot of people from Europe would like to work in the UK and would like to move there. Um, that Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that evolves a bit. So the EMA exits London, geez, was that a year and a half ago or so? And they moved to the Netherlands. And I guess, I don't know if the, I don't know if the MHRA just moved into their offices or how they work that. (laughs) Probably not. But, uh, but how do you think that's going to affect then having the EMA in Europe, right? How does that affect London directly? Maybe the environment is what I'm talking about, sort of the pharmaceutical environment and just not having that presence. Does that just sort of drop the presence of scientific talent overall in, in London and, and cause a knock-on effect in that way? I think that talent, good people in healthcare will find roles and they are attracted to some great companies that they have that are based in the UK, you've got a lot of biopharma development going on in Oxford and Cambridge. You know, the latest Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is a is a good example of collaboration between the university and industry. John Bell is someone we know in our firm exceptional. He drove that 
And uh, he is all about creating more new companies in the biopharma space in kind of that Oxford, Cambridge area. Obviously, you've got GSK, Pfizer's got a large presence in the UK, and, and obviously AstraZeneca. So I think that the EMEA going to uh, Amsterdam is unfortunate, but the economy and the system will, I think, absorb those jobs and the MHRA will uh, they'll continue to take over. You know, and sometimes different types of forces, uh, as you say, sort of force an issue. And I was reading, I think it was in the New York Times this morning about the potential impact of the uh, Pfizer vaccine being made in Belgium and then being, you know, having to be shipped to the UK. And I can imagine that that is the type of driver that could cause uh, very quick uh, adjustments or uh, decisions made around the import export laws for pharmaceuticals. So hopefully that's a positive outcome, right? I can't imagine the UK would put up a, a block to something, you know, to the, to the um, vaccine coming in from Belgium, but it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Yeah. I, I, there's not a politician on the planet that's, that wants to mess with people's healthcare uh, and access to healthcare. So I, I think that Politicians in the UK are very sensitive to that topic, and I, I think it will sort itself. Uh, how it sorts itself is unclear, but I, I do think that calmer heads will prevail and common sense will prevail in the end. You made one comment I'm just curious about here. You said that you're uh, you're getting your UK citizenship now, so moving away from Brexit a little bit, but I'm just curious, if you don't mind uh, sharing what uh, what motivated the UK citizenship, and are you able to be a dual citizen then, US, UK, or do you have to give it up? Yeah, dual citizen. It's a dual citizenship, and uh, living and working in the UK a long time, and uh, to a certain extent, I guess it's a badge of honor, and to a lesser extent, it gives me a little bit more flexibility to work in the UK. So uh, instead of being on a work visa, I can uh, more freely come and go. One of the things I really enjoy talking to all of my guests about is is mentoring. And in the scientific field, uh, of course, I'm very you know aware of, of mentoring and you, you have your PhD advisor and they're your mentor. And so there's this sort of natural progression, sharing and developing. Uh, I'd be interested to hear from you kind of your experience with mentors and mentoring and, and how that works in, in your field. At any given point, uh, I, I usually have two, sometimes as many as three people I like to work with. And mentoring is about a relationship. You can't force those things. So there are um, individuals that I like to work with to help them achieve their full potential. And I think helping talented people improve is is something that everybody should do regardless of kind of your position whether you're scientific or non-scientific it's kind of paint it back a bit so the kinds of people i typically work with are e either younger people that are trying to get ahead in either uh, non-technical roles typically and want to move from a technical role into a managerial role which is sometimes really, really hard to do because what's been ingrained in you as a scientist or someone in you know, a technical capacity is often counterintuitive to what you need to do in management and leadership. And there's obviously a difference between management and leadership. So oftentimes people with deep technical backgrounds have great managerial skills, but they don't have good leadership skills. So helping them with that leadership, be real, be yourself, be there in the moment, be yourself is, is, is something that, you know, we talk a lot about. So that, that's part of it. The other end of the spectrum is I, I work with people that are actually farther along in their careers. And I talk about a good, better, best continuum and creating force multipliers. So taking a CEO, like a first time CEO and helping them polish what they do in this, this new role that they're playing so that they can be that force multiplier. They don't have to do everything that they did in the prior role. They need to identify good talent. You don't have to deliver the goods, rely on other people to be there for you and with you. So that's what I do with uh, the, the people I tend to men mentor. I was talking with a former colleague last night a little bit about this. We just happened to get on the topic. And one of the things we were... Uh, 
talking about is often people don't want to take that accountability. They're afraid to take the accountability and to, and to make the decision because they don't want to make the wrong decision. And, and she and I were both saying that that's something that's helped us in our career. Uh, sometimes it gets you into trouble, right? You make the decision, you put your foot out there and you put your hand out there. Sometimes you get burned, right? But for the most part, I think it's really helped me in my career. And, and that goes back to advice that I got long, long ago. The other thing that resonated, uh, well, actually a lot of what you said right now resonated, but uh, another thing you, you mentioned that did you know really stick with me as a scientist is when I first took over over a P&L responsibility, profit and loss responsibility for the department. We had a, a, a CFO at the company at the time that uh, grabbed me and he said, hey, Chad, you need somebody to teach you these financials. You need somebody to sit down and really understand this and walk through this. So he said, we're going to, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to sit down every week. We're going to go over where we're at. You know, it's going to seem repetitive, but you got to learn the words. You got to learn the lingo. You got to, you got to understand what these, uh, you know, at that time, I really didn't know the difference between revenue and profit and EBITDA and all, you know, all these different uh, terms that are so second nature now. So that, that was a really uh, key mentorship in, in my life that helped gained me a little bit of financial literacy. So I just find it so invaluable and I find it so enjoyable to have the chance to work with people. And I hope uh, with COVID and all the working from home and, and as that's going to change and continue to have people working from home, I hope we can figure out a way to continue to have water cooler conversations and things that are going to, that lead to these mentoring opportunities. Cause like you say, they, they can't so much be made as they need to kind of sprout up organically. So you worry about that you know, in the office, right? If you're not bumping into people. The other thing I'm always curious to hear about hobbies and interests. And, and again, 2020 question, are, do you have any new hobbies you've picked up or have you focused on anything in 2020 with COVID that's kept you busy? Yeah. I, so I'm going to toot my own horn. I'm going to be proud of the fact that I did 2000 miles on my road bike this year. I'll never do it again, <laughs> but I was able to ride a bike 2000 miles this year because I was working from home and forced myself kind of at the end of the day on nice summer afternoons to ride a bit. I don't think I'll ever be able to say that again, but I did it this year. <laughs> and what a great activity. I think that's what uh, we saw, you know, especially back in April, May, right? You were sort of either locked in your house or you had to get outside and do things outside. And so many people gravitated outside. You know, you saw so many families, you know, out doing things because they weren't doing it with everybody else. Right. Mike, I've really enjoyed talking with you. I want to give you a chance to hit any highlights of anything I missed from your role in biotech to Brexit, the mentoring, anything else. Uh, maybe you want to say hi to somebody out there. Uh, you're, you're on a podcast. So any, any closing thoughts or, or ideas <laughs> well, that you want to share with us? I, I think that now has never been a better time to be in healthcare. Just if you think about the global need for healthcare and great healthcare right now, it's never been a better time to be a part of that story. I've been fortunate enough to work and with a couple of great companies like a Quintiles, like a Bioagilytics that are really truly doing some, some life-changing things. And uh, that's something that all the employees that contribute to that should be proud. And it doesn't matter if you're, you know, the receptionist all the way up through the CEO, everybody's making a difference. And I think that's really important to remember. I think the Brexit stuff will sort itself out uh, one way or the other. It'll be all okay. It's just going to take some time. And uh, I share your want, need, desire, Chad, to get back and have some social contact with even people I don't like. Yep. <laughs> Anybody would be fine about now. But no, I, I uh, think uh, better days ahead. And I look forward to continuing the journey with Bioagilytics team. And uh, it's been a great experience. Thank you for the invitation. Mike, thank you once again. Thanks so much for joining. And thanks for everything you do for Bioagilytics. Uh, really, really appreciate the time. That is all for episode four. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, subscribe, uh, like, rate us, check us out on all the favorite podcast apps so you never miss a conversation. If you'd like to hang out with us outside of the podcast, we have many webinars and other presentations available for enjoyment and education. Visit bioagilytics.com to see what's coming up and how you can stay in touch. And don't forget, keep an eye out for episode five. This is going to be our final episode of the first season of Molecular Moments. 
We'll be sitting down with Dr. Tina Morris, president of the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists, where we'll get some insight into the challenges and opportunities of running a scientific society in 2020. And we'll also be doing a special year in review wrap up of the scientific highlights from 2020 through mine and Tina's eyes. Thank you so much. Molecular moments would not be possible without the support of our sponsor, Bioagelytics Labs. Bioagelytics is a global contract research organization specializing in large molecule bioanalysis. Based in Durham, North Carolina, with labs in Hamburg, Germany, and Boston, Massachusetts, Bioagelytics provides high quality bioanalytical services to leading pharma and biotech companies around the world. They offer assay development, validation, and sample analysis under non-GLP, GLP, and GCP, as well as GMP quality control testing. If you are looking to work with a team of highly experienced scientific and QA professionals through all phases of clinical development, look no further than Bioagelytics. For more information or to speak with their scientists today, visit their website at www.bioagelytics.com. Thanks for listening to the Molecular Moments Podcast.